and the today's speaker is dr sudesh kumar sahu uh, he is an associate professor at iit indore and he did he obtained phd from iit madras under the supervision of professor panasami and his main areas of research includes uh, geometric function theory cosy conformal mapping hyperbolic metric and john domain and uh, uh, special kind of metrics and he has published uh, very popular articles uh, such as in a reputed journals journal of israel journal of mathematics journal of mathematical analysis and applications math nahritan and journal of, and many other journals uh, with such a brief introduction i request to this kumar sahu to start his lectures uh, yeah thank you uh, thank you so much sahu anyway so it is a great opportunity for me and a special thanks goes to of course the whole organizing committee but a special thanks goes to dr shuman uh, who sent me the invitation uh, and uh, many communications uh, on this event thank so you. thank you so much uh, dr shuman and uh, and the other organizing committee most welcome yeah so uh, my syllabus actually you know uh, already available online also it was communicated to me through email so i have to start through uh, cosy's inequality and applications by the way uh, so this is my email id if someone wish to contact me for some discussion please feel free to contact me uh, okay so my this uh, cursor is visible uh, on the screen yes sir okay good yeah it is visible okay good so uh, anyway so it is uh, good to uh, uh, repeatedly understand uh, certain basic things so that we understand more and more you know, deeply so <clears throat> okay so by the way uh, so there will be tutorial session by uh, i understand that by dr manas ranjan mahapatra later for my part so uh, i i think if we solve many more problems then we understand more you know, that you know vision should be there so whatever i uh, we whatever we discuss in my lecture uh, those are actually basic and i try to uh, explain little neatly uh, uh, so that you know we understand more and more the theory part and then of course you know some uh, application like examples are also discussed and then many more problems will come actually on tutorial part okay so uh, i start with cosy's inequality i hope uh, all of you have studied cosy's integral formula so uh, this will actually come from cosy's integral formula immediately so anyway uh, let's see because its uh, title title is actually geometry of complex functions therefore i try to give geometry wherever you know whenever it is possible or wherever it is possible. so this your voice is yeah. breaking sometimes voice is breaking okay now it's okay now it's okay, okay fine thanks so <clears throat> now what this uh, cosy's inequality says okay suppose f is analytic inside and on the circle so look at the picture circle i have drawn here the notation is c and center is z not and radius is r this is what the circle and f is analytic inside this circle and also on the circle and the second condition is given that f of z modulus is less than or equal to m it is bounded by m m is a finite constant on this circle on c then then we have this cosy's inequality this is called cosy's inequality so nth derivative of f at z not at the center its modulus is bounded by m times n factorial over r power n okay so m is coming from this boundedness finite constant and n factorial is coming from nth derivative and r is coming from the radius of the circle okay so that's all 
so this inequality is actually very important and it has many applications we will discuss you now some applications here of course so this is what you know this cosis inequality says okay so i hope uh, it is clear to everybody if if you have any doubts or questions in between please feel free to ask me so there is no issue at all okay so most important is understanding the concept not completing the concept okay so that is uh, that i like okay so here uh, anyway so pictorially also this is explained here so if we understand this pictorially then it is easy to remember also so for longer time okay. anyway so let's see the proof how it goes so uh, from cosis integral formula so just nth derivative what actually cosis integral formula says you know once we finish once we study once we understand cosis integral formula like this this is the formula for this circle then what happens it is actually n times differentiable at a point so this is what you know analytic function is you know infinitely differentiable one of the definitions actually it is there it comes actually after cosis integral formula so that is from there actually it follows anyway uh, this is the formula n factorial over 2 pi i and integral over c c is that circle and then f of z over z minus z naught power n plus 1 dz so now since we need to estimate look at the statement again we need to estimate this quantity so therefore modulus we need to take to the formula so just take modulus then modulus of this integral we have some properties from complex integration continue integration so that property we will be using and then you know, hypothesis again we will be using then finally we reach to our destination whatever we wanted to prove this is what so estimating this we obtain so left hand side this modulus of nth derivative of f at z naught then uh, less than or equal to n factorial will be there this is positive and 2 pi iota modulus is actually 2 pi and then in this modulus will go inside the integral modulus will go inside the integral then modulus of f of z is there and modulus of z minus z naught is there and n plus 1 power is there in the denominator and then dz modulus will be there this is actually by properties of integration some modulus properties is there now what happens we need to use uh, we need to use hypothesis so f of z modulus was actually less than or equal to m capital m so therefore m is coming here uh, n factorial is already there we are not changing anything 2 pi 2 pi is already there 2 pi now here denominator r power n plus 1 is there why because c this circle is actually z minus z naught mode is equal to r so therefore this quantity is simply r uh, r power n plus 1 is there now what is remaining is dz modulus dz modulus is remaining inside the integral but what is this quantity this is what you know length of the curve length of the curve so c is actually circle so this perimeter is actually 2 pi r the radius is r actually then this uh, length of the closed curve closed contour is actually 2 pi r so therefore 2 pi r is multiplied here hmm. then we simplify this 2 pi is getting cancelled and r1 r you know factor is getting cancelled so remaining is n factorial in the numerator times m and denominator r power n so this is what you know we wanted to prove it we wanted to have this inequality so this uh, this completes the proof of this cosis inequality so if if you have any questions or doubt please let me know on this theorem or the on this proof sir can you illustrate how modulus of dz is uh, having the length of the curve ah uh, this is actually it comes in complex uh, integration it's a formula actually hmm. uh, you can just take you know z equal to 
r e to the power i theta you can take and then simplify so then you will get it so uh, unfortunately okay. i don't have writing yeah yeah so just you take z equal to r e to the power i theta just differentiate and then you can bring it to you know because c is varying this r theta is varying from 0 to 2 pi and uh, then if you simplify this you will be reaching to length formula all right okay sir please, please try sir. yourself yes basic exercise so that is integral 0 to 2 pi uh, gamma yes. dash of t into dt yes so in the last gamma class we have also modulus. seen the same thing yeah <clears throat> gamma dash t modulus and then dt thank you sir yeah Sir, uh, F Z is bounded on uh, circle only or a whole uh, closed disk? Yeah, uh, it is on the circle only hmm. because we are integrating over the circle. On the circle, we are integrating, so not inside. Okay. okay so this is what statement says: F of Z is bounded on the circle, hmm. and here also we are integrating on the circle. So therefore, we can apply. Good. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. So let me proceed next. Sir. Yeah, please. Uh, if it is bounded on the uh, circle, then it is bounded on disk also. How do you say that? Something similar, you know, that we will be discussing uh, when we come to maximum modulus principle. Okay, for time being, uh, let's no, not go to that part. Okay. Okay. So, uh, let me, yeah, hope up to this it is clear to all. Now, application of Cauchy's inequality, uh, let's see some applications. Uh, we need actually uh, here Taylor's theorem the first two applications though in in my you know, syllabus portion Taylor's theorem is coming late but you know I'm just giving the statement briefly but not the full discussion so this is what statement says of course you know it is um, it is uh, familiar to most of you but you know this is this, this will be discussed later in detail so therefore I have written here to be discussed later in detail so, but statement just, I, I actually only need this coefficient formula in terms of derivative. Mm -hmm. An equal to nth derivative of f at the center over n factorial. So, that formula I therefore, you know, I have to discuss, at least I, I need to state this theorem. So, what it says, look at the picture, omega is given domain, mm. f is analytic on that omega containing the point A here, then it is possible a power series form, power series actually of this form, power series means this is of the form about some point A, about this point A. Of course, again, power series in detail we'll be discussing with radius of Kermajers and all. So here this power series, now this series is actually convergent in this disk, Z minus A modulus less than delta. So this, uh, Delta is actually distances from A to the nearest boundary of omega. In this picture, this is the nearest boundary. So within this disk, we can write this you know, power series representation of this function, analytic function. Okay. So therefore, it is written, you know, where delta is the distance from A, the point A, to the nearest boundary point of omega. Moreover, this uh, an the coefficient nth coefficient will have some integral formula that again you know i repeat this is to be discussed later in detail okay so now just we need this formula the coefficient an is equal to nth derivative of f at a over n factorial so this formula we need in uh, in the following two applications of Cauchy's inequality okay all right now, uh, therefore, you know, most surprisingly, I'm saying with the help of Taylor's theorem and Cauchy's inequality, uh, one can actually characterize entire functions 
satisfying certain specific region. Function, entire function we can characterize, but function is satisfying certain inequalities in some specific region. So then you know we can apply these two theorems. One is Cauchy's inequality, another is Taylor's theorem to characterize and functions. Let's see first example, first uh, application. Let m be positive, this be a constant. Then we characterize all entire functions f of z satisfying this modulus of f of z is less than or equal to m times r power lambda. Here, uh, uh, this r is actually coming from mod z equal to r. On this circle, this is again, you know, upper bound is actually m times r power lambda. And for lambda positive, mm -hmm. lambda can be zero also, not an issue. Okay. So we have to characterize all entire functions satisfying this. F is satisfying this inequality on this circle. How to do that? So because we are on the circle, we can apply Cauchy's inequality. And you know, uh, when, 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 uh, because we are characterizing entire functions, entire functions means it is analytic throughout the complex plane. So therefore, in particular, function has to be analytic inside this circle, mod z equal to r, inside that. So therefore, uh, we can use Taylor's theorem to get such power series of this form because this is about origin, center is origin. So therefore, z minus a factor is not there because a is zero. So therefore, just z power n is there. Summation a n z power n. And a n has this formula we know already from Taylor's theorem. So now what happens? Uh, what is the idea? Now if we prove that a n from certain n, then uh, then uh, up to n minus 1 has term polynomial okay so that is the idea so how do we do that just we apply Cauchy's inequalities on the circle then a n modulus is nothing but modulus of nth derivative of f at 0 over n factorial because a n is that formula uh, now nth derivative uh, of f at origin over n factorial is less than or equal to m times r power lambda over r power n. So this is coming from Cauchy's inequality because fz has upper bound this one, therefore that quantity is coming and n factorial was there in the numerator but now since it is already in the denominator here, then we don't have here in the numerator. And denominator we had r power n here also same r i am choosing some same notation i mean to say so r power n is there but here if we keep m uh, in the numerator and bring this r power lambda to the denominator so therefore minus lambda will be there so r power n minus lambda now you see um, for what range of n this will go to infinity whenever uh, n tends to infinity, sorry, uh, yeah, r tends to infinity. So then this goes to zero, we need to say. So here a n, uh, this, this quantity, maybe the last quantity m over r power n minus lambda goes to zero whenever n minus lambda is positive, otherwise no. Uh, Suman, please mute some of the students' mic. yeah so uh, yeah till now if you have any doubt uh, on this application part we can discuss uh, or we can sir here mod yeah here please mod of fz is less than or equal to yes f of z mod is less than or equal to capital m times r power lambda on the circle no no when when we apply that mod of fn0 is less than m n factorial upon r power n, their mm -hmm. function was bounded by m. Yeah. So here function is bounded by m r power lambda. Yeah. 
okay so that is the reason m r power lambda so you can take this uh, m r power lambda as some other notation say capital n then capital n has to come here by ah, yeah. okay sir okay yeah yeah so that's the reason you know cosine inequality directly we are applying here ah yes okay. yes yeah any more question okay no we proved that an converges to zero when our n is more than lambda uh, that means uh, that means what up to lambda this is non zero we can say the maximum you know up to uh, so therefore what we say fz is a polynomial of degree at most lambda not beyond lambda because beyond lambda we are getting zero so at most lambda so therefore what happens you now we, we could characterize all entire functions satisfying this inequality and what are those entire functions these are actually nothing but polynomial of degree at most lambda not beyond lambda so all that means all polynomials are actually entire functions there are many more entire functions uh, uh, are there so when uh, liouville's theorem we will discuss that time discuss some some of the examples uh, sir so for uh, exponential or sine function this condition is not satisfied because they are not polynomial yeah yeah yeah, yeah. right sin z so, is unbounded yeah, yeah. sin z is unbounded you cannot use sin z cosine z they are unbounded function exponential function is also unbounded uh okay so here only polynomial you are getting characterizing means there are no other entire functions other than this polynomial so therefore you know there is no question of sine function cosine function or exponential function so these are the only functions entire functions satisfying this property this is the meaning let us go to the next application slightly uh, modified form um here we characterize all those entire functions f satisfying uh, some other type of inequality so here in you know, a mod z power 5 over ln i mean log with base e modulo sub z and here actually outside the unit disk mod z is bigger than 1 a function is satisfying like this how to explain this or how to characterize entire functions satisfying this inequality now what do we do because we have you know mod z is bigger than 1 we choose a number capital r bigger than 1 outside the unit disk we choose a number r this is what you know let us choose a number r bigger than 1 arbitrarily then fix it i mean on on that uh, circle with radius capital r we will be applying cosine inequality that is the meaning now since f is entire it is analytic in this disk mod z less than r okay entire means it is analytic in the complex plane throughout so therefore in particular in this disk also the function has to be analytic okay now what happens we apply taylor's theorem in this disk so fz has taylor series expansion of the form this one our series and uh, center is origin therefore factor just factor z z square you know, like this it is there and coefficients are there as it is and this coefficient has this formula nth derivative at origin because center is origin and our n factorial okay now uh, now we need to estimate this coefficient an so if we prove an is zero uh, what is the idea if we prove an is zero for all n bigger than equal to some m when our r is very large r tends to infinity then we can claim that f is a polynomial of degree at most m minus n one uh, similar you know, like application one we discuss same way and the idea is same yeah and just here we are choosing a circle outside the unit disk now for mod z is equal to r we have this 
f of z modulus is less than or equal to this whatever was given to you and then it is since it is outside the unit disk and on the circle also we can apply so since mod z is equal to capital r so this is coming r power 5 and denominator ln r because mod z is equal to r and let us say this is capital m this is my capital m now we can apply process inequality so modulus of a n is nothing but modulus of derivative n f derivative at zero over n factorial and uh, by Cauchy's inequality this is less than or equal to m over r power n here capital r i have taken and uh, this is uh, nothing but because m is nothing but r power 5 over ln r so that we substitute here uh, then r power 5 we bring it to denominator so minus 5 will be there in the power so r power n minus 5 and then ln r was there as a factor in the denominator now this goes to zero whenever r goes to infinity uh, but when n minus 5 is bigger than or equal to zero because ln r is there even though uh, n equal to 5 uh, n equal to 5 means this r power n minus 5 is 1 that is r power 0 is 1 so still 1 over ln r goes to zero when r tends to infinity so therefore you know this n n equal to 5 is included here however the first application that was not included because ln r was not there some other factor was not there in terms of r so now n equal to 5 onwards 5 6 7 8 so on this a n is becoming 0 therefore up to 4 we can say maximum degree is you know, 4 therefore this shows that you know because of this a n is 0 for all n bigger than equal to 5 so therefore, we conclude that Fz is a polynomial of degree at most 4. So it is coming from Taylor's theorem. Because all coefficients from A5 onwards 0. And therefore, up to 4, up to A4 we can have. So that is a polynomial. So therefore, at most 4. So if you have any question, we can discuss. Is it clear or clear? If some of you please feel free to ask now we must discuss your problem so oh. sir, uh, if mod fz is bounded by uh, any number then mm -hmm. it, mu it must be a polynomial of certain degree. yes this is what you know uh, uh, yeah, f is bounded on a circle. Okay, then now whatever explanation is there, yes, then we can you know we can reduce to a polynomial. Provided you know we, we could prove these coefficients are actually vanishing from certain range. So it is likely that you know they will be polynomial. Yes, because on the circle we are taking. And then denominator is coming in terms of radius, then automatically it goes to zero in the okay. okay. So now application three is uh, Liouville's theorem. Liouville's theorem in three different way it is understood because many authors write in many you know, equivalent form. So I give you all the forms. You know, sometimes you know, college teachers or students even they confuse. So this is the most familiar, you know, the most popular statement. Every entire and bounded function is constant. Every entire, entire means analytic throughout the complex plane. Bounded means modulus is bounded by some finite constant. Then uh, this function has to be a constant not other than constant mm -hmm. some other way uh, also we write a non-constant entire function for example sin z it is a non-constant entire function it must be always unbounded therefore we can say sin z is unbounded mm -hmm. for example so it is actually contrapositive statement you know like if we start with right hand side negation of constant this non-constant entire function 
then it has to be unbounded simple some other way also a non constant bounded function cannot be entire like we can give one example 1 over z uh, outside the delta circle delta is positive so this cannot be entire because at origin it is not analytic so therefore in uh, three different way these are actually second two are actually contrapositive statements for the first statement uh, they are all equivalent this is lebelius theorem all right okay so let us discuss uh, its proof let us discuss its proof suppose that uh, f is entire with uh, modulus of f of z is bounded above by m for all z in complex plane because uh, this is given entire and bounded so for some constant m of course entire and bounded this is what uh, hypothesis says now what happens what is the idea if we prove the derivative of f is zero for all z then we can say that f is constant right this follows from you know one of the theorem if derivative is zero first derivative is zero for you know in a domain then f has to be constant in that domain and here domain is the whole complex plane so therefore if we prove derivative is vanishing first derivative is vanishing for all point in the complex plane then we can say that f is constant throughout the complex plane this is the idea so derivative is vanishing means something related to cosis inequality derivative term is coming or cosis integral formula one can use let's see now let us take some arbitrary point z not uh, instead of z and then uh, then finally we can replace z not with z doesn't matter so now we prove that hmm, derivative first derivative at z not is zero this is what we wanted to prove but you know we we, we for this we take the help of cosis inequality cosis inequality we know and then we need to prove uh, this first derivative is vanishing now it is given that f is analytic in the whole complex plane c this is the notation for complex plane and it is analytic in the disk this z minus z not z not is actually given point uh, already we assumed so we take a disk uh, with radius capital r for any radius r positive just arbitrarily choose uh, some disk so that we can apply cosis inequality on this disk on the circle on the boundary in fact so now by hypothesis so because you know function is bounded on the whole complex plane it is given therefore function has to be bounded in particular in this circle on this circle z minus z not mode is equal to r that is denoted by c so that we can apply cosis inequality this is the reason we have we have chosen this uh, radius or the disk so that we can apply cosis inequality all right so by cosis inequality uh, it follows what is this is n equal to 1 here first derivative means n equal to 1 uh, so therefore n factorial means it is one factorial in the numerator so just m over r r power n was there but n is 1 so therefore r is coming so this is for every r positive now when r is tending to what infinity because r is arbitrarily chosen so therefore you know when r tends to infinity this quantity is tending to zero so therefore f prime z not is actually coming to zero because f prime z not modulus tends to no, no, less than or equal to zero but it is actually bigger than or equal to zero so therefore f prime z not is actually equal to zero coming so this is what we wanted to prove so since z not is arbitrary we can say that f prime z is zero so this is what written f prime z is zero for all z in c and you know by that theorem as we discussed 
the f has to be constant function so this is very simple proof of this levelius theorem so any question please on this levelius theorem I hope everybody understood. So if there are no questions, we can you know, move maybe. Yeah, any question? No. Okay. Now uh, applications of Liouville's theorem. First we start with Cauchy's inequality, then its applications. Then as an application of Cauchy's inequality, we just discussed Liouville's theorem then now we go for application of Leibniz theorem so first is you know first application is called actually generalized Leibniz theorem so what it says you know, a non-constant entire function like you know sin z cosine z you know polynomials we you know where you know non-constant polynomials i should say and uh, and exponential function those are non-constant entire function they actually come arbitrarily close to every complex number uh, for example you know as i mentioned or their linear combinations in fact they are also entire some of the picture you know from mathematica i try to draw but some specific you know like i have taken z equal to r e to the power it yeah. uh, r is actually for first two picture cosine z and sin z r i have taken till 5 0 to 5 and for the last two pictures, R I have chosen from 0 to 2. So these pictures are giving for certain you know, values of Z. So that you can have a feeling uh, how actually like you know, in case of real analysis, uh, curve tracing is little bit easy and depending on again the function, but in complex it is not easy. So therefore we take the help of certain tools like Mathematica or MATLAB. So these are the functions. Now this is cosine function with some uh, values, and this is sine function. The third one is exponential function, and the fourth one is actually the polynomial. I have taken z plus z square by two, z plus z square by two. Somehow I missed to write. You no, know, maybe. Uh, so anyway, so this is a polynomial. From a polynomial, it is coming. So when uh, when we increase when we increase the radius, uh, then you know many overlapping will be there, like here overlapping. For sine z we are overlapping here. For cosine z we are getting overlapping here. But up to radius one there will be no overlapping. But this is something related to uh, harmony or univalent functions. But that is higher study. I am not going to discuss those things. Anyway. So uh, it says a non-constant entire function like this, they comes arbitrarily close to every complex number. That means they take every complex value hmm. arbitrarily. There may be some, you know, some possible exceptions like exponential function, it does not take zero. So maybe one exceptions, but almost every complex value they take. So proof of this, you know, this is called generalized Liouville theorem. Why? Because we apply Liouville's theorem to prove this. Uh, it is uh, named as generalized Liouville's theorem by some authors. Yeah. So like we prove this theorem by contradiction method. Contradiction is actually equivalent to contrapositive method. Contrapositivity of a statement. And we use Liouville's theorem here. How? Its the proof is very simple. Suppose, you know, because we want to apply contradiction method, suppose that f of z is entire. It is, uh, it is given, right? Non-constant entire function, it is given. Uh, so, uh, and that, uh, suppose fz is entire and this fz does not come arbitrarily close to every complex value. So this is on contrary, we are assuming. Then what we do? We prove that f is constant. But hypothesis says that f is non-constant. So that will be a contradiction. So this is the idea of the proof. 
and this will lead to a contradiction to the hypothesis because hypothesis says non constant if you look at the hypothesis it says non constant but by you know applying liouville's theorem we will prove that this is constant so therefore uh, if it does not come arbitrarily close to every complex value then what will happen this is what so uh, there we can find a complex number a yeah, such that this f of z minus the difference you know, difference will be bigger than equal to some constant k because they do not come close to a therefore there will be some distance gap so therefore at least you know, more than k it will be there you know distance difference between them for some constant positive so this is this is what you know uh, when we say f of z does not come arbitrarily close to a complex number that means there is a gap between those two that means at least the k distance is there then what happens just we take the reciprocal of this 1 over f of z minus a modulus will be less than or equal to 1 over k the inequality will be reversed and here gz i am taking as 1 over fz minus a then modulus is coming less than or equal to 1 over k so this is my notation of gz so now we apply this uh, liouville's theorem for gz because gz is bounded by some constant here and uh, you see since f is entire the new function is also entire because f of z can never be a therefore denominator cannot be actually uh, non -zero, no, zero so therefore uh, this is entire function and also it is bounded and hence it has to be constant by liouville's theorem g has to be constant so this is what so when g is constant then f has to be also constant because uh, they are you know very trivially they are related so therefore f is a constant function so we are getting a contradiction so this is what an explanation so if any question please feel free to ask on this yeah so we just uh, completed 45 minutes yeah if you have any question on this particular part we can discuss generalized liouville's theorem no question okay okay our uh, next application of this uh, cosis uh, sorry uh, liouville liouville's theorem is the fundamental theorem of algebra from abstract algebra it's very well known now what it says every non constant polynomial uh, it talks about non constant polynomial not any entire function other than polynomial here polynomial specific entire function so every non constant polynomial has at least one zero this is fundamental theorem of algebra at least one zero of course from here we can conclude if we take a non constant polynomial uh, or a polynomial of degree n then it will have n zeros you know that we can deduce from here so first let us prove it has at least one zero Uh, suppose you know, pz is a polynomial degree positive you no know, positive maybe you can take n n is bigger than 0 positive then what happens what is the idea of the proof so we prove this theorem hmm, through contradiction method by assuming that pz never vanishes uh, because uh, it says that you know statement says it has at least one zero now contrapositive means we need to assume that suppose it has no zeros that means we are assuming pz never vanishes that we are assuming then we must get a contradiction we must get a contradiction uh, we will see okay that is the idea so therefore we need to assume on contrary that pz never vanishes that means it will have no zeros it will have no zeros this is the idea 
then what happens when pz is non vanishing then one over pz we can say it is entire function there is no z so that pz is zero that means one over pz will be entire function it is analytic throughout this is this we are getting all right so anyway by the way i missed to um, announce or say that you know one need not write if you have any question or doubts on certain points you can write on your note because this lecture slides i will be sharing to the organizer who will you know share with you and this is what you know instruction is or lecture note but i will be happy to share this presentation you know file so that you know, pdf version so that it is easy to follow you know, rather than reading some a4 size paper so uh, and later also you know if you have any doubts from from this lecture note or lecture slides you can you know, write to me you can mail me so we can discuss our email also that is no issue so what happens here when one over pz is entire then um, if we prove that one over pz is bounded then we can apply lebesgue theorem so one over pz will be constant in that case so now we need to show that one over pz is bounded so then um, it will lead to a contradiction that pz will be constant because hypothesis says every non constant polynomial hmm. so therefore through you no know, by lebesgue theorem again we will conclude that pz is constant that will contradict to hypothesis the so hypothesis says non constant hmm. so therefore we need to show only or it remains to prove that uh, one over pz is bounded how to do that we know uh, that pz is diverging to infinity for z diverging to infinity because pz is a polynomial simple when z tends to infinity pz also will go to infinity there is no doubt so therefore one over pz will be tending to zero as z tends to infinity actually modulus of no modulus of z i should have written but doesn't matter it is in that sense so one over pz tends to zero uh, when our z tends to infinity then what happens so uh, when z tends to infinity that means we can choose a larger radius uh, r capital r so that when our you know mod z is bigger than that r then we see that you know one over pz mod is less than 1 because one over pz mod tends to zero you know very close to zero so therefore when z tends to infinity so therefore we can choose a very large r very large r so that this because this quantity is tending to zero so modulus has to be bounded by one so we can always choose such large r so therefore for a large r so we are getting this one over pz is bounded by one so now uh, this is actually outside this is outside the disk mod z bigger than r now we need to prove that in inside the disk also mod z less than equal to r also one over pz has to be bounded hmm. so then only throughout we can say that it is bounded this is what you now we wanted to prove hmm. so therefore it remains to show one over pz hmm. one over pz is bounded for mod z less than or equal to r because we just prove this is bounded for mod z bigger than r so what is remaining inside the disk and on the disk also circle circle also mod z is equal to r so therefore once we prove one over pz is bounded for this then throughout the complex plane one over pz will be bounded and that is already entire because pz is non zero already uh, we have uh, discussed so therefore but this is trivial because this mod z less than or equal to r is a compact set a closed and bounded set Uh, and this is continuous function because entire means is analytic analytic means it is continuous so therefore since continuous functions on compact sets are actually bounded therefore one over pz is bounded on this mod z is less than or equal to r uh, so so that's it so therefore one over pz is bounded for all z in the complex plane and this is leading to the conclusion uh, because one over pz is bounded we just proved 
1 over pz is entire we have discussed therefore by leibniz theorem 1 over pz is constant and this this will imply that pz has to be also constant so that is a contradiction to the hypothesis because hypothesis says non constant polynomial but we are getting a constant polynomial so therefore you know we started with on contrary uh, pz is non vanishing now we are getting a contradiction to the fact that f is actually non sorry pz is actually non constant that was the hypothesis yeah so if you have any question we can discuss on this part so by the way uh, uh, suman uh, is there any um, uh, i mean mechanism or is there any guideline that there should be some break in between or we continue till one one and half hour yeah you can continue sir okay Very fine as per your convenience yes. okay 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 now because i do not know how it is going on i have not attended any other lecture so uh -huh. are, yeah you can okay. guide me i can just tell yes, you yes. continue so this okay fine fine yeah so any question uh, so far on this uh, sir, yeah mod of, mod of pz uh, in in place of pd pz there should be mod of pz at uh, infinity where uh, first line of the slide first line of this slide uh, yeah yeah so here uh, modulus actually we should take uh, pz modulus tends to infinity for a modulus of z tends to infinity uh, that uh, mm. yeah that will be more clear yes more suitable yes because yeah you know complex number has no ordering if you if you understand in that sense yes we should have modulus there but in fact when we say uh, one function is bounded one complex function is bounded means modulus is actually bounded by something so in that sense actually you know in that sense also it is understood when pz tends to infinity means its modulus is actually tending to infinity in that sense actually uh, i have written but anyway it will be more clear if we put the modulus there i already told there good yeah so if there are no question we can you know proceed for next i hope everything is clear to all of you yes sir okay yes sir good yeah so next uh, this is what you know, i already mentioned uh, we can derive from fundamental theorem of algebra that every polynomial of degree n has exactly n zeros uh, they of course not necessarily distinct there may be multiplicity but exactly n zeros we can if we take polynomial of degree n how uh, just from the statement what we just the existence of at least one zero let us assume that zero be z1 z1 then what happens this uh, z minus z1 will be a factor where you know at z1 it is vanishing that is the meaning z1 is a zero or root so then this z minus z1 expression you can just factor it out then it is remaining you know, this uh, you have uh, a polynomial of degree n minus 1 so 1 degree is reduced uh, when we take this z minus z1 factor out so now we have a polynomial of degree n minus 1 then it will have again by fundamental theorem of algebra it will have again at least one zero okay then again you take that factor out like this you continue then we will be getting actually exactly n zeros this is the idea so applying the fundamental theorem of algebra, I have denoted here FTA, fundamental theorem of algebra, with this new polynomial, uh, degree n minus 1, we can obtain another 0. Then this process can be repeated n times to have n zeros, simple proof. So therefore, um, uh, as a consequence of fundamental theorem of algebra, we can, we can say that a polynomial of degree n has exactly n zeros. Of course, this has a different proof 
later uh, but we are not going to discuss that because i don't see that part in the syllabus like roche's theorem is an application of roche's theorem we can prove also but anyway uh, this is proved here using you know it is actually direct consequence of uh, fundamental theorem of algebra so again uh, if we compare with generalized leibniz theorem what was generalized leibniz theorem every <coughs> non constant entire function assumes uh, almost you know, all complex value but here specifically for polynomial you know polynomials are actually entire functions if we have a polynomial of degree n they will assume each number exactly n times you know we have more information when we talk about polynomial of degree n we have more information than generalized leibniz theorem so how does it follow uh, it's uh, it's generalized leibniz theorem we uh, recall here is non constant entire function comes arbitrarily close to every complex number but this corollary uh, say you know have more information about particularly about polynomial of degree n they assume each complex number doesn't matter that also says you know by generalized leibniz theorem but here extra information is exactly n times exactly n times so therefore you know uh, how does it follow let us take one arbitrary complex number c small c hmm. then what happens pz is a polynomial of degree n by hypothesis we have to assume one polynomial of degree n then write this qz as pz minus c and this is also a polynomial of degree n now q we have a polynomial of degree n this qz is a polynomial of degree n then we apply fundamental theorem or the corollary one the previous corollary one this qz has n zeros specifically it has n zeros when qz has n zeros that means whenever qz is zero pz will be c that constant since qz has n zeros therefore p takes c n times Uh, this is the idea uh, but qz is zero if and only pz is c that is trivial and because you know p, you know because qz uh, takes zero n times so therefore pz takes the value c n times this is what the proof so therefore because c was arbitrary complex number and pz you know is taking the value c n times uh, this is what the statement every polynomial of degree n assumes each complex number exactly n times this is what the proof exactly n times very simple as a consequence of fundamental theorem of uh, algebra okay so any question please on this no okay now uh Uh, now of course uh, this maximum modulus principle uh, is the next part coming uh, in my you know the syllabus content whatever is given to me and uh, this maximum modulus principle uh, is also called maximum modulus theorem the first form and there are two forms actually the first form is called maximum principle or maximum modulus principle uh, and other one is called maximum modulus theorem specifically that we will discuss later and that will be the second form of maximum modulus theorem what is uh, what does it say actually so if f is analytic and non constant in a domain d then its absolute value has no maximum f is analytic is given in a domain and it is non constant also then its absolute value has no maximum in d it has no maximum in d of course again you know similar to leibniz theorem uh, there are three ways of understanding the statement here also same thing uh, there are three ways of understanding this statement it's more of a you know uh, contrapositive you know, this or equivalent statement how one can understand in other way 
that if f is analytic in a domain that is already given and earlier it was non constant uh, then conclusion was its absolute value has no maximum but here we are assuming in the negation of the conclusion that is its absolute value has a maximum in d then f must be constant simple that means analytic function in a domain and its uh, his uh, its absolute value has a maximum in d then f has to be constant f has to be constant and uh, some other way also one can understand if f is analytic in a domain d then modulus of f cannot attain a maximum unless f is constant this way also uh, language just changing the language nothing else modulus f cannot attain a maximum unless f is constant okay so there are three different way uh, this maximum modulus principle is understood and various authors write various languages so therefore but all are equivalent there is nothing to worry at all now when we talk about proof of this theorem or proof of this principle then uh, we need certain information and those information first we need to discuss uh, to deal the proof of this theorem okay so now question, one question i ask does this leibniz theorem follow from this maximum modulus principle mmp maximum modulus principle so uh, may i have answer to this very basic question look at the middle uh, middle sentence f is analytic in a domain d and d can be the whole complex plane its absolute value has a maximum in d then f must be constant can we say that leibniz theorem follow from this uh, maximum modulus principle yes sir yes 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 sir actually no hmm. Actually, the other way follows right sir sorry the other way it may, it may be true right sir other way is trivial right yeah but hmm. this i think it is not other following. way also you know we cannot say because if we replace this domain d by c then it is okay yeah by the entire complex plane it may work uh, yeah uh, but uh, again you know maximum has to attain inside the domain yeah but uh, how to say it is no because when we take modulus of f when we are saying modulus of f has a maximum in d but that quantity may not be a finite quantity right because you now when we take uh, an interior point where maximum is attaining so this modulus may not be a finite constant because you know when we say leibniz theorem modulus of f of z is bounded by some finite constant so here a maximum may not be a finite constant so this is the problem so though it looks like that leibniz theorem follow from here but here is the problem it may vanish so therefore uh, actually uh, leibniz theorem does not follow from this maximum modulus principle Sir, so, but I have a doubt, sir. Yeah, please. Sir, maximum means it is the supremum, right? Supremum when it is given in that set. Yes, yes, yes. Fine, supremum. Yeah, so it, is... it should be finite, right? Supremum uh, may be infinity in this case. Okay. Yeah, that is the problem. Oh. So, what is supremum of uh, one by z? So, yes, z yes. Is... Okay. Okay, yeah. sir. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. So we will discuss, you know, the radius of convergence, you know, in the power series case. That radius of convergence also can be infinity. Uh, so similarly, here uh, this maximum may be, you know, this this value may be unbounded. Okay, but we should have, you know, to apply uh, to uh, compare with Leibniz theorem, we must have a finite constant. So that is the there is the problem. Otherwise, 
otherwise it could have been straightforward anyway this is just a remark now for the proof of this maximum modulus principle we need the behavior of an analytic function analytic function how does it behave uh, at a sequence of points that influences its behavior elsewhere you know, other places if if we have some information about or uh, on the set of uh, on the sequence of points in a domain then can it behave throughout the domain the first result actually brings this concept in a disk this is called uniqueness theorem for a disk look at the picture you know pictorially also it is very easy to follow uh, this uniqueness theorem for a disk actually we need uniqueness theorem uh, for arbitrary domain or you know for a disk especially uh, to uh, have a complete understanding of the proof of maximum modulus principle uh, of course there are different proofs but uh, whatever proof we are going to discuss there we need so what does it say look at the picture f is given you know f is analytic in the disk this is the disk center at a radius r so inside this disk function is analytic given now suppose we have zn with the sequence of points uh, distinct points converging to the center a look at the picture and on those sequence you know this zn this uh, they are actually zeros of f that means f of zn is zero if this is happening then f will be vanishing throughout the disk this is what you know uniqueness theorem says so it goes to the unique point zero this is what it is called uniqueness theorem so this is uniqueness theorem for a disk and its proof is very simple proof is very simple uh, how uh, how does it follow let's see again here you know we will apply taylor's theorem that the function f is a power series expansion about z equal to a because we are saying that f is analytic in a disk in the disk z minus a mod less than r so a is center radius is r inside this disk function is analytic then taylor's theorem says it is a power series expansion in this disk that means this series is convergent in this disk that means f of z we can write is equal to this uh, in this disk that means a naught plus a naught a1 times z minus a plus a2 times z minus a whole square and so on a n times z minus a whole power n and uh, what is the idea to prove f is identically equal to zero this is what you know we wanted to prove right f is identically equal to zero everywhere in the disk that is our m so if we prove uh, a n's are zero for each n this each coefficients are actually zero then automatically f of z is zero so this is the idea now we need to prove a n is zero for each n first let us see how to prove a zero is zero and then a one is zero then a two is zero then inductively same procedure will follow to show that a n is zero for each n now what we do the analyticity of f f is analytic given guarantees that f is continuous at z equal to a analytic means uh, it is continuous automatically now because it is differentiable on a neighborhood of a so therefore it is continuous at a so uh, one that uh, limit uh, limit definition of the sequence definition sequential limit it says of the continuity that whenever zn goes to a then f of zn goes to f of a that is one of the characterization of continuity so that characterization we use here what happens now by assumption what we get limit n tends to infinity f of zn uh, this is actually equal to zero how because it is already given look at the hypothesis again f of zn is zero for each n f of zn is zero for each n given then we are going to prove that the f of z is zero 
so that means uh, this limit f of zn is zero but this limit is actually f of a from the previous uh, statement the therefore f of a is zero but what is f of a from the taylor series f of a is just a not f of a is just a not so therefore a not is zero a not is zero now we remove this a not because a not is zero uh, then we can rewrite f of z starting from a1 uh, then what happened yes, uh, we have to prove that a1 is zero how to prove just take z minus a factor out then we write a1 plus a2 times z minus a plus a3 times z minus a whole square so on continue mm -hmm. so uh, this is what then z minus a we take left hand side to the denominator then apply limit then what happens this limit n tends to infinity uh, because uh, sorry yeah so this this quantity is actually a, a1 because when n tends to infinity zn tends to a this is what it is given and the sequence is converging to the center point a in the hypothesis let me go back the sequence zn in the picture you can see or you can read there zn is approaching to a therefore uh, this is there whenever n tends to infinity zn approaches to a so when zn approaches to a then you see all the factors are becoming zero except the first term a1 therefore this a1 is coming but what is f of zn f of zn is exactly equal to zero so therefore this limit but zn is not equal to a remember so therefore by limit definition this limit has to be zero so therefore a1 has to be zero continue same 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 way we continue so in general uh, uh, in general uh, inductively so we just take z minus a power p common then we start from ap then ap plus 1 uh, times z minus a and so on so similar way this limit actually will be zero and this is exactly nothing but ap the first factor a uh, remaining factor will be zero whenever z zn goes to uh, a so therefore f of zn you know when we take f of zn so everywhere zn minus a will be their factor so that will go to zero so therefore this limit actually zero which is actually equal to ap similar to the previous explanation so therefore an is zero for each n inductively mm -hmm. and result follows so when an is zero for each n so by from this taylor's theorem this expression f of z is actually equal to zero so this is what we wanted to prove f of z is zero everywhere in the disk so proof is simple uh, and just it's the matter of calculation and then applying the hypothesis appropriately to get the solution so there is a question yeah please that z as zn tends to a as n tends to infinity then the sequence zn minus a tends to zero then how is it possible limit n tends to infinity f zn by zn minus a equal to zero because f of zn is exactly equal to zero huh? yes sir f of zn is exactly zero but limit zn tends to a so when yeah. we will take the limit as n tends to infinity then mm. zn minus a is also goes to zero yeah so so you then can this form becomes 0 by 0 it is not 0 by 0 uh, it is of course limit when you consider it is 0 by 0 but uh, this f of zn is already 0 0 by actually non zero term forget about the limit term limit uh, expression just f of zn over z minus zn minus a is actually 0 isn't it uh, yeah f of zn over zn minus a because zn is not equal to a remember ah. so uh, you can recall the limit you must have uh, done many limits when numerator is exactly equal to zero 
then automatically limit will be zero even the denominator is coming in the limiting sense zero otherwise sir, you can take a lopitas rule to prove it so this we can think uh, in this way right sir considering as new sequence and yeah. uh, as first if you consider f of z divided by zn minus as uh, g of zn then mm -hmm. g of z1 is zero g of z2 is also zero mm -hmm. so it will be a zero sequence so it will converge to zero Sorry, can you repeat? Denominator sir, like f of z1 by z1 minus a, right, sir? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Make, uh, uh, n equals to one, then it is f of z1 by mm. z1 minus a. That is zero. Yes. Similarly, f of z2 by that thing is also exactly. zero. Exactly. That so is what I am saying. Yes. yes. Actually, f of zn over zn minus a is zero. Simple. Then limit will be zero. Very simple to understand. Okay. So, because you are taking the limit, you are considering the limit, that is the problem. But if you just remove the limit part and just take f of zn over zn minus a, that quantity itself zero is equal to zero directly. So, therefore, limit is zero. Simple. It is uh, not like zero by zero form in the limiting sense. It is actually exactly equal to zero without limit. Then automatically limit is also zero. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Hmm. Clear. Uh, sir. Yeah, please. Uh, sir, in the statement, uh, the sequence Zn converges to the center point. Yes. So suppose we have another sequence which converges to some other point in the disk and f of Zn is zero. Then can you conclude that f is zero in that case? Yes, so that part we are coming. Uh, we are coming. If if one sequence, you know, sequence of zeros converging to another point, yes, but sir. inside the disk, yes, uh, yes, then also that that will happen. That is actually uniqueness theorem for general domain. Uh, that we are going to discuss okay. afterwards. Okay. Okay. Good. The time six twenty. So. Maybe, uh, uh, yeah, if you have further questions, we can discuss. Otherwise, I can continue maybe one more. Uh, Hello, so this. Hello. Hello, so this. Hello, so this. Hello, so this. Yeah, disconnected. Yeah, I'm just calling. I'm just calling. Yes, sir. Yes. Ah, so this I think you have been disconnected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we could not see. Uh, ju just can you log? Uh, can you just? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. The, the speaker lost the network connection and he is rejoining in just a minute. Uh, kindly just wait for some time. Suman, is it possible to pause the recording uh, instead of just stopping it? Pause is not an uh, option. Okay. We shall continue uh, then. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he will be joining. Yes. He lost the network. Hmm. Yeah.
Yeah, in use. Yeah. this uh, is it possible for you to join or uh... okay 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 thank you thank you hi so this You, you can unmute your mic, Suresh. Uh, your mic is muted. Yeah, yes, now it it, go, it works. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Yeah. So should we continue or maybe we can stop here or what is your yeah, suggestion? Yeah, you can stop here and you can uh, just yeah, we can, have any doubts. In the yeah, yeah, we should have interaction, more interaction session. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there are this, I have minutes. a small comment. Uh, yeah, please. Please. There is a one slide. If you can show, are you can you able to share the slides again? Okay, okay, just a minute. One of the slides, the function f of z is equal to mod z or something by ln mod z. Can you just go back to that slide? Okay. okay. There is a small typo is there. Oh, really? I, I didn't yeah. mark it. So maybe the second application of uh, uh, process uh, in so, Oh, no, no. Actually, uh, that uh, the function yeah, is analytic for mod z greater than r. Ah, here, here. So, yeah. yeah. Next, next slide. So this next slide. See here for outside of the unit uh, disk, uh, the function is defined, right? Is bounded by that quantity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you take r is greater than one, the function the function is entire and analytic for mod z greater than r. That is. R greater than one, mod z greater than R. That's outside of the disk. That is outside of the unit disk. That is a analytic function. So if you take yeah. mod z less than R, it includes the origin. Yes. No, no. This is what we want. No, because uh, because uh, function is entire. That means analytic in the throughout the complex plane. Only this inequality hold in, in the outside of the unit disk. So when we say f is entire, that means it is analytic in this group. Because analyticity in this disk is required to apply uh, Taylor's theorem. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is what we need, this analyticity we need. But inequality we are applying on the R. But R is uh, bigger than 1, therefore you can apply this inequality. But here we don't have to take more than bigger than R. If you take mod z bigger than r, we cannot apply Taylor's theorem. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, some small misunderstanding, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question, uh, so please? Sir, yeah. Sir. So, yes, sir, what sir. is the need of mod z greater than one in this uh, preparation? That is actually uh, to apply Cauchy's inequality. Look at here. Uh, we have applied Cauchy's inequality here. 
because this inequality is valid for mod z bigger than 1 and r is bigger than 1 we have chosen so therefore we can apply cosis inequality to apply cosis inequality we need a number r which is bigger than 1 that's it ln 1 is 0 therefore no no mod z bigger than 1 that is the no, reason no, no. his question is why you want mod z greater than oh okay 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 yeah 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 So yes. ln one is zero. Therefore, we are mm. considering outside of the unit. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, here in the statement, yes. If mod z is equal to one, then problem is there. All right. Mm, yes. Yeah. Any other question, please? Sir, in the generalized Liouville's theorem, sir, uh, uh, it's entire uh, non-zero function. Then it attains every complex number, right, sir? Yeah. Like, and there you give the example of exponential function. It is entire and non-constant, but it doesn't attain zero. Yeah. So, sir, there's uh, and instead of writing, sir, every complex number, can we uh, replace this every by almost like that? Ha. Uh -huh. arbitrarily close to that is the reason comes arbitrarily close to close to not exactly oh, okay. Okay. okay that is the meaning yes oh yeah yeah but see. again you know picard's theorem will come but that is not part of here picard's theorem said with possibly with one exception it like e, e to the power z you know it has one exception zero it cannot go to zero it cannot take the value zero oh. there is yes, no picard's theorem actually says more precisely Answer one more, sir. Uh, like maximum modulus, can we in the same statement can we say that modulus of that thing absolute value does not attain minimum value as well? Uh, can we? Yes, 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 yes. That is also true. That that we will discuss when we prove yes. that. After that, we will discuss. In the coming class, we will discuss that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so. so if there are no doubts uh, no questions then sir. let us thank the speaker uh, yeah do you have any questions sir actually Arohit. is this cosis mm. inequality is best possible or we can also get some more good inequality because n, n factorial is in numerator na no, sir yes n factorial is in numerator yeah so uh, can okay. we get more more good estimation of that upper bound sir okay very good uh, point let me think do you have time or no its time is there is no other lecture right after this yes sir yeah no other lecture yeah please oh, no yes okay so to uh, go back to okay 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 i got it yeah it's a, a good point that means we must uh, get a function where equality holds if this is uh, if this is uh, sharp uh, if this inequality is sharp yeah hmm uh, n factorial is there mm hmm or at least can we say equality holds for some okay how about uh, so z power n we it will work actually yeah that's what i am thinking uh, some polynomial uh, suppose we take z power n n as derivative will be some constant time in factorial uh, times n right z power n means n n as derivative n and of course uh, it is depending on the bound you know this uh, when we say it is bounded it is depending on that bound m uh, so uh, in that case uh, See, f for n of z uh, not by n factorial is nothing but your a n. That is the Taylor coefficient. Mm -hmm. so your Taylor coefficients are less than equal to m by r for n. 
So mm. that depends on the what kind of class you take. Suppose if you specify the class, okay, yeah. then you will get the uh, bounds. For example, mm. if you add the univalency or something, so mm. then you will see that that is the best bound. Yeah, in general, probably no, but uh, I need to think, yes, because it is depending on the upper bound for modulus of f of z. So if that is uh, sharp enough, then probably we can, that means m has to attend you know, uh, at a point on the circle. Okay. Then probably we can say yes, because n factorial is independent of integration. And then um, R power M that will come as a uh, from from uh, from uh, formula it will come. Once we bring this M outside, then it is enough. So because F of Z modulus is less than equal to M, that is depending on F. So that is the reason we should have. You know, if probably if F of Z modulus is equal to M on C, then probably. So actually, this this so no, this question answer. is no. So this uh, Rohit question mm -hmm. is: Is it the best possible, or we can get a better than this uh, estimation? That's what. Am I right? Yeah. So I do not know. My answer is I do not know. Okay. But uh, maybe uh, next class uh, I will have some idea. Huh? I'll tell you. Yes. Sir. Okay. Tomorrow. So actually, this bound is getting worse now. As n goes very large, this bound is getting very washed. Mm -hmm. Because we should get a better bound on derivative. Mm -hmm. This one should understand not in terms of derivative, Rohit. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. n of z not by n factor, but a n. That is the Taylor mm -hmm. coefficient is bounded by bounded by m by r yes, r for n. In that sense, you have to understand. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. But of course, you know, as Vasu uh, uh, mentioned, in you know higher study in univalent function theory, there are many discussion about uh, bound for Taylor coefficient. In fact, uh, Biberwak uh, conjecture, which is known as De Branche's theorem, was proved uh, after several years. So, but there are many studies still going on. For other classes, so therefore some criteria is required. You know, univalency, as you mentioned, depends depends on function. You know, then only we can talk about sharpness. Yeah. But under some restrictions, uh, some sharpness are already studied in higher study, you know, higher complex analysis. Yeah. Good point. But this is that is research oriented, and there are study. The sharpness part is already studied. On unit disk, it is Thank studied you, for instance. Yes. Okay, good. If there okay. are no questions, let us thank uh, Dr. Sudesh. Sir, what, what, one thing yeah, in this regard. Uh, so, if we uh, consider the sequence like uh, factorial n by r to the power n and take the ratio un plus 1 by un, then we will get altogether capital M by r. So, uh, uh, can we say something uh, like if we take M by r less than 1, something like that, uh, relate, then actually this bound goes to 0 as n tends to infinity. So, uh, in that sense, this uh, bound is uh, quite well good enough, sir. Yeah, yeah, I can understand. Yeah, but how do you apply uh, uh, this ratio test here? What is ratio test? No, on the uh, on the right hand side, that sequence factorial n by r to the power. Okay, okay, okay. Hmm. Doesn't matter, you know. You can you can just you know, verify. You can you know just uh, have a trial and error method. You can check. You can check. Maybe we can discuss uh, further tomorrow. Yeah. 